Hi, everybody. This is Peter Diamandis, and welcome to our next episode of Exponential Wisdom. Here with my dear friend, colleague, mentor, coach, Dan Sullivan. Dan, a pleasure, pal. Well, Peter, uh, this is always a high point in any week that we have our podcast scheduled, so this has been great. Advertising, this is a fascinating topic because a lot of people don't realize that the entire world system really runs on getting messages out to people about new possibilities. Yes, I want to talk about advertising from the perspective of if you're in the advertising business, it's about to change dramatically as if it hasn't changed dramatically already in the last 10 years. But if you're a consumer, it's going to change for you a lot as well. And I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about how is advertising going to change over the next decade? And I have some ideas I want to share, which I think are pretty extreme. And then, Dan, the reason I wanted to talk about this with you in part is you're an advertising pro from your earlier life. So let's open up with a little bit about what was advertising like when you were in the business And let's talk about how it's changed recently. Well, it was 1971 is the actual reason why I came to Canada, because I had graduated from college, and through a direct relationship, I was just given an enormous opportunity, when I think about it, to come to Toronto to join an agency which had just become part of BBDO, which is one of the big global advertising agencies. It wasn't like Mad Men, the television series shows the 1960s in New York, I can guarantee you, except for the amount of alcohol that was consumed, there was no <laughs> no similarity. But it was pretty straightforward sitting here in 2017 and look back, you know, you just basically had print, TV, and radio, and you created commercials of varying length, none more than a minute in North America. And then you had print. And I was on several big accounts that still exist, like Chrysler and Kraft and TD Bank. These were big, big corporations. And there was real methods and processes that you go through, but there was an enormous confidence that this was the way it was always going to be. And of course, it's changed. You just told me a stat a few minutes ago. Why don't you repeat that? Yeah, well, it appeared in the middle of, I just looked for trend documents that show this is the way things were, this is the way things are heading, and that had to do with the fact that Facebook and Google, just as separate companies, but combined, they now command more advertising than all the print media in the entire world. That's insane. And both companies are roughly a decade old, so in 10 years the entire advertising industry has transformed to a fully digitized, social media-centric, which at the end of the day has driven a lot of newspapers out of business, Mm -hmm. right? A huge consolidation in that business and is driving, as we talked about in a previous episode, a lot of the TV channels to get much more sensationalist to capture your attention and Mm -hmm. capture, because their business is delivering your eyeballs, their advertisers. Mm -hmm. So here's a thesis I want to throw out to you and I'd love to talk about in this session. When I think about how is advertising going to change in the future, here's my pitch of what I'm seeing. So at the end of the day, when I'm watching TV, which is kind of rare, or if I'm Googling something to go and buy a product, advertising business is to convey in an instant why that product should appeal to me. And it's going to have a sexy woman. It's going to have a, an amazingly fast car. It's going to create some relationship to who I want to be. Or it's going to convey the vitamins, the minerals, the health appeal of that. And so in some instant, it's going to try and convince me that this product is going to get me someplace And all I knew is I wanted toothpaste or I wanted shampoo or I wanted a sweater or something like that. And so when I think about that, I realize that the way we're going to buy products in the future, I believe is going to change. And as a result of that, advertising is going to change. And here's my pitch to you, Dan, and everyone listening, and I'd love to get your feedback. So I think in the future, the way that I'm going to be shopping is that I'm not going to be shopping. My AI is going to be shopping. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have an AI that notices that the butter is running low in the fridge and it knows my consumption rate over the last 
24 calendar months or that my toothpaste supply is low, whatever the case might be. And the AI is going to automatically do a lot of the shopping for me, just stocking the stuff that I normally use. Or I may say, you know, I need a new gadget, whatever that gadget might be, and would you please go and get one for me? (laughs) And so what would the intelligent AI do when I describe my desire? It would probably do a couple of things. It would look at all of the range of gadgets and look at their cost, their performance, their fundamental metrics, because it can analyze all 50 options. And the other thing it might do is it knows my social graph. It knows the 100, 200 people that are very much like me. And it might go out to their AIs and say, hey, has your human used one of these gadgets and which one have they liked or disliked? At the end of the day, it would make the purchase for me based upon those fundamental metrics Mm -hmm. of which was the healthiest, the lowest cost, the safest, or liked by my social graph. And I will not care about any ad. I'm not going to trust any ad. That ad's trying to brainwash me. I want my AI to figure out what is best for me Mm -hmm. and go and get it. So at the end of the day, I think advertising is either going to get crushed, destroyed, dematerialized, demonetized, as a new D, dismissed, (laughs) or the company is going to be advertising to my AI. What do you think about that? Well, it strikes me that Amazon is already doing that because they talk to me about five times a day. Dan, we notice that you've been reading this. Other readers who have read this have also read that. So I'm seeing this, and quite frankly, I find it a very pleasant experience. I just want to say that right up front, Mm -hmm. because they're saving me time, and they're also introducing me to new things that I didn't know about. That's the one thing, but it also brings up, you were talking about the butter in the refrigerator getting low, And it brings up the whole topic of the Internet of Things that you've had at Abundance 360 about that, that your environment will sense some fairly predictable things that ordinarily you would have to attend to. And things won't get low if you take proper advantage of intelligent machines around you, your refrigerator, your stove, the whole maintenance of your home, the whole maintenance of your business, it will sense we're noticing wear in this particular electrical circuit, we're noticing this. So things that would blindside you before you're now getting warning. So it seems to me if I'm an advertiser, I'm seriously investigating social media The recent election in 2016, one side did a much better job of analyzing not how people were thinking about the election, but just what issues that they were talking about, and they could direct ads immediately at people who had crucial issues. People didn't even realize they were being observed. Their conversations were just being data processed, running it through Watson or something and saying, this is what people are devoting an enormous amount of emotion for it. So my feeling is that being able to identify what people's emotions are, strongly negative or strongly positive, is going to be crucial to advertising. And so much of this is going to be done by AI, both at the advertiser side, and it's going to be done by AI at the consumer side. So I agree. I'm just thinking it's going to be much more dramatic in that I'm going to opt out of most of my buying decisions. I'm going to simply make a comment to my future version of Alexa or Google Home or Apple HomePod, whatever has won the fight for my living room. And I'll just say, you know, I need a new mouth guard or I need a new Apple Watch Mm -hmm. charge cord and get it for me. I will express my desire and it will decide where it goes and it buys. Interestingly enough, and I've talked about this before, it may be that if you give command to Amazon in your home, Amazon will always opt to buy from Amazon, Mm -hmm. right? Or you may have a third-party AI agent that says, you know, we're not going to do that. We're actually going to compete and find across all the platforms the lowest price, but you're going to pay us a 0.001% VIG for us to do the comparison shopping. But at the end of the day, I think the majority of our purchases, save for one area, 
will be done fully autonomous, independent of advertising, and based upon real data, like health, like what is really healthy, what is really... One of the craziest things, you go to Walgreens or CVS and you have the brand name of a particular medicine and the generic of that medicine. They're the exact same thing, but yet as a human, you will pay an extra dollar for that brand because it feels better. But it's bullshit. It's the exact same formulation and chemicals in the generic. Mm -hmm. And of course, your AI won't make that mistake. It will say it's identical molecularly and all of your social graph who use this product got the same results. And so we're going to save you money and buy that. There is one distinction, which is if I want to, for my ego purposes, want to show off to my cohort, I will buy a branded product. I will buy a Louis Vuitton purse over a generic purse, even though they're functionally the same. When I pay for an expensive brand, I'm making a outward mm -hmm. focused statement. Yeah. And so this is my view for the future. I'm going to high expensive name brands mm -hmm. are going to command because it's the overtone that matters, not the functionality. And everything else is going to be completely demonetized. There's a model that I created about 20 years ago where I said that people will maximize their commodity experience. So this is your generic because I want to save money for the purchases of my status experiences, my status products, my status lifestyle. So my feeling is that you either position yourself as high-end with the best possible brand, or you position yourself as the fastest, easiest, cheapest generic, because people don't have an unlimited amount of money yep. to take care of their needs and wants. This is why Walmart, on average, a community has a Walmart, their cost of living goes back before Amazon came along. But I still think it's true where Amazon doesn't have reach that people will utilize Walmart or Sam's Club and they'll absolutely economize on their basics so that they can save up money for high-level experiences. But here's the question. Have you noticed a trend in your own life of cutting off yourself as someone that advertisers can get to and then just making a whole number of automatic decisions and say, well, I don't care yep. how this gets purchased. It just has purchased. Do you notice a trend in your own life? I have. I have got a great team around me. Yeah. And I will talk to Esther or Connie or Nikki and just say, get this for me. Get something that does this for me. And then they make the decision, right? So for those business people who have amazing chief of staff, executive assistant, personal assistant, when you reach that level of life and you have enough wealth to do that, you do because time is your most precious element and you are not going to take the time to go and research the thing. But if you can have someone else do it, and eventually your AI is going to do that for you. Yeah. So yes, I do that right now. Yeah. There are very few things that I go and buy myself and look at the ads and do comparison shopping and so forth. I do the same with networks of unique ability people. I'll give you an example. Babs and I bought a cottage about four years ago. We bought the cottage and we bought it because somebody said, this is a good cottage for you. We saw a picture of it online and we sent in the deposits so that we got the cottage. And then we had the designers, decorators come in and look at the cottage. Mm -hmm. And we walked them around for three hours and said, this is what we want. And Babs and I had done sort of an impact filter of what we wanted. I love it. <laughs> it was a complete redo of the whole cottage and then an expansion of the cottage. And we did that in October of the year. Next June, we walked into the finished project, and not once during that intervening nine months had we actually visited the project. You know, it was all done, but we were so convinced about the skill of the people that we were working with. They had done previous work for us. They had always delivered on time and delivered what we wanted, and then we just gave them very clear specifications and said, you know, when we walk in next June, this is what we want it to look like. And when we walked in next June, it looked like that. And they cried. They said, the amount of trust that you have in us 
is unprecedented. We've never had anyone who just basically laid out what they wanted then and trusted us to do that. And I said, I don't have time to be untrusting. <laughs> but I want to bring that point up. Yeah. You don't have time to be curious about an enormous number of products or services. You just don't have the time for that. Unless that product or service is something that you are personally interested in. Yeah. Right? Like when I was buying a drone, I went to CES, Consumer Electronics Show, and I went and looked at all the drones for personal passion, curiosity, desire. Yeah. Because I cared about that. Yeah. And then I found the drone. I have a few of the Mavic drones by DJI. These little pocket drones are amazing. And I'm going to go to CES this year and probably find the next generation of that. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine how much better they're going to get, but it's awesome. But the rest of the shit, I couldn't care. I was laughing because it's the power of the impact filter to decorate your house as well. <laughs> it's great. Well, <laughs> if I'm dealing with an AI program, I'm going to have to do an impact filter too so that the AI program gets the correct specification. I don't care whether you're doing this to a team of skilled people or you're doing it to an AI program. It's still going to have to start with your intentionality. It's still going to have to start with your yeah. specifications. So what it points is knowing what you want and what you don't want. The chief skill, you know, I think of living in the 21st century world is knowing what you want and knowing what you don't want and having very clear-cut rules about it. Awesome. You know, a lot of people, they're open to looking at whatever the world wants to present. And I said, you're opening your Yourself to massive overwhelm. I know what I want. Clothes-wise, here I'll give you an example clothes-wise. I'm convinced that the 1930s was the best designed clothing period in the United States, if you look at the old black and white films. Mm -hmm. So I'm a pleats guy. I'm a cuff guy. <laughs> I'm a, and people say, Dan, you don't dress any differently now than you did 40 years ago. And I said, I had the style down 40 years ago. I <laughs> Why should I change? <laughs> I said, I'm a style guy. I'm not a fashion guy. But just take that example and move it into every area of your life. If you talk about your lifestyle, Peter, probably it's much more clear cut what constitutes your annual lifestyle now than it did 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, right? Because there are places where I want to spend mental time thinking and places where I don't, right? So I know this is true of a lot of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs as well who will wear the same thing every day, day in and day out. You know, Dean Kamen, God bless him, one of the most extraordinary designers, engineers, technologists of our time, wears denim jeans and a denim shirt, and that's all he has in his closet. So when he went and visited the Oval Office many times over the Clinton and Obama administration in the Oval Office, and at black tie dinners, he's wearing his mm -hmm. denim jeans and his denim shirt because he says, I don't want to spend an extra iota of my brain thinking about what to wear in the morning. Yeah. Amazing, right? And other people, they'll spend hours because that's what they care about. And that's fine. Yeah. But at the end of the day, going back to the original premise here, I think that an AI, you know, this whole concept of neural nets and machine learning and AI... I've talked about this for a long time, that we're heading towards a time where we're all going to have an AI software shell. I want you to imagine an AI that you wear on your body, that listens to everything you say, sees everything you see, watches what you eat, reads your emails, listens to your conversations, and you give full permission to this. And as your AI is doing this and paying perfect example to the choices you make and the choices you don't, it's going to learn you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to train up a neural network that thinks like you think. Mm -hmm. And that neural network is going to be a neural network which can complete your impact filter for you and can make the choices for you that you would have made. So I think we're heading very much towards a point where you're going to abdicate responsibility because... I know over many, many years, I've had these administrative assistants, executive assistants, and so forth. Esther, who's with me now for the last four odd years or so, is the best I've ever had. Mm -hmm. She's amazing. And I trust her implicitly on making decisions for me because I know she thinks the way I think. Over the last four years, she has been able to adopt writing style, thinking style, conversation. She's that good. So there will be an AI even better. I'll call her Esther 2.0. <laughs> so the whole notion of training up neural nets, and this is what AlphaGo, how it won the game of Go, 
is that when you're able to train a neural network to do something over and over and over and over and over again, it learns and it creates a neural net. And so a neural network observing us 24 hours a day, seven days a week for years will eventually think just like you think. Maybe. I believe it will. Here's my point, and it's the Gary Kasparov, what he's done with the AIs. He said, okay, we're just going to move chess to the next higher level, and every grandmaster is going to have an AI program. But it's still that somebody is going to be superior with the use of their AI over all the other AIs. I have a rule. This actually came from our first meeting together. This was at Mountain View, and Ray Kurzweil, who was coming to Abundance 360 this Mm -hmm. year, just to put in a little advertisement. (laughs) (laughs) Ray has been on the path of this for probably his thinking life. He's been pursuing where artificial intelligence is going. And at a break, I went up and I talked to him. And I said, are you talking about consciousness here? And he says, you know, we haven't the foggiest idea what consciousness is. He said, we know what computational level is at a level that's a million billion times higher than human computation level. But he says, we haven't the foggiest idea what consciousness is. I have a rule, and I wrote down the rule that day, that humanity is always infinitely bigger than anything that humanity creates. That what we do is... We up our game. And I was thinking about this. I was driving on the freeway where things were moving really quickly. Everybody's moving along at 40, 50 miles an hour, and there's hundreds of cars moving in both directions. And I said, if you had presented this as a picture of the future 100 years ago and you could show somebody, they would have gone catatonic just from looking at the film. How could human beings possibly operate, you know, in machines going this fast? But we've just adapted to it. I mean... I've caught myself, and I'm sure you have, driving, and after about a half hour driving, suddenly realized that I was driving. Yeah, my brain is someplace yeah. off and thinking, right? Yeah. So my feeling is, I think humans just up their game, and the Kasparov example was interesting to me. He's just going to play a higher level of chess. You know, they're going to have a different level of chess. I agree with you on the notion of AI-human collaboration, right? We have an entire X Prize that's going on in this in terms of AIs and humans collaborating to solve big problems. What I'm saying is that, and it goes back to the point you made earlier, which is your fashion design sense was locked in 30 or 40 years ago, right? So the ability of an AI to look at different things and choose things that you would like probably would do a damn good sense, right? So this AI software shell that's around us, that is operating with us, I think is going to learn us very well. Mm-hmm. Anyway, for those of you in the advertising business, <laughs> things are going to change. That's right? where we started, yes. Things yes. are going to change. You're going yeah. to be advertising to AIs and your time talking to a human to convince them to buy these cigarettes or drink this booze is going to be, unless you're a luxury brand and by drinking that super ultra gold tequila, whatever it is. And you're doing that not because it tastes better, because you want to show off. I'd say, I'll never forget when I was in Dubai last year, I went to this one store, which was like billionaire's brand. And the stuff there just cost 10 times more than it should have. Yeah. And the only reason you did that was because I don't care about money. I can flaunt it and show it off. And there's a value when money becomes less and less meaningful and you want to demonstrate to people that you have lots of it, it's a very shallow way of doing it, but that's part of it. Yeah, well, we all have our interests that we pursue avidly, like the drones that you talk about, but things are as valuable as people want to pay for them. You can't argue. I mean, I follow sports, so I'm your outlet on the world on sports. (laughs) Thank you, pal. (laughs) Yeah. And somebody just signed a contract for $310 million in baseball. Is that the small ball? Yeah. That's yes. The the small hard one, right? Yeah. Hitting a curve is the secret of that sport. But anyway, and I was in a conversation, they say, nobody is worth $310 million. And I said, well, of course they are. Somebody just wrote the check. Yeah. Yeah, and the very interesting is that there's an interesting statistic from the 1950s compared to now. It's a 70-year statistic that the average salaries that players are making today 
is exactly the same ratio as the value of the sports franchise oh. in 2017 as it was in the 1950s. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah, and there's no variation. Rising tide. The owners know what the ratio is, and therefore the checks that they're willing to write is totally based on what the value of their organization is. So my feeling is that things move to higher levels, but this is not a provable discussion. We can each bring our own. But I think humanity operates in ways that are not computable, and they're not detectable by any mechanical means. It's an ongoing discussion, and it's an interesting one because that's my confirmation bias, and I'm going to bring enormous evidence to the table, and so will you. Well, pal, as you know, we're on a 25-year journey at a minimum together, so... You know, in a decade or two decades, we'll return this conversation and we'll see, hey, remember that time I told you? (laughs) Dan, you were so right. (laughs) And on a previous podcast, I talked about that I'm completely open to both winning and losing. So uh, (laughs) so, Uh, this was delightful. And I bet we're scaring the daylights out of a lot of people who think that advertising is going to more or less be the same. Well, I don't know anybody in advertising who thinks that today. Yeah. But I think that the dimensions in which you have to pay attention to in advertising have expanded exponentially. And the means of advertising and the subconscious of advertising, it's just that if you're advertising to someone who's not making a buying decision, Mm -hmm. who cares, right? So it's like you can advertise all you want to my kids, but I'm the one buying it, so you better be advertising to me. And you can advertise all you want to me, but my AI is the one who's making a decision, so you better advertise to it. And I've had this exact same conversation with the largest brands, and they are paying attention because they realize that this is is coming. Here's my kicker. There's going to be 50 AI programs out there who are competing with your AI program for your attention. (laughs) Yes, they are. (laughs) Peter, I want to be your servant. Uh, So here's a fun conversation for our next podcast. I believe we're heading into a time in the near future in which everything in our lives is going to become intelligent. When I was in China, I was seeing this company manufacturing these $5 chips that would do machine learning. So you'd put this chip in your kid's toy and the chip would be able to listen and learn and be able to accommodate and so forth. So here's my question. What's the world going to look like when everything around us is intelligent? Would that be a fun conversation for us to have? That would be great. Cool. Yeah. All right, pal. Right from where I am, I would welcome it in many areas of my life. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I'll see you in the next podcast, buddy. Thanks, Peter. Take care.